lessons from 13 years of reefing. What I'm going to do tonight is share with you what I've learned over the years, some big lessons that I've learned not only on my tank, but also on clients' tanks as well. It's a big shift when I went from just managing my reef to managing other reefs and doing it remotely where I wasn't there looking at the tank twice a week, once a week, or once every other week. I don't service tanks. I have one client here in Nashville where I service, but I don't service remote tanks. I build the tanks for people. I coach them through as they're getting used to it, as we get in the system up and running. And then it's not uncommon that they don't hear about me. So there's a big shift there. I'll talk about that along the way. We'll get into that a little bit later in the evening tonight. Let's get started. First thing, my first dream build started a little bit like this. I had freshwater fish for a long time. I saw this fish at the local fish store and I said, it's time to get a saltwater tank. I always dreamed of a saltwater tank. That's what I wanted. I was 10 years old when I saw this fish and my dad was with me because I couldn't drive back then. And I probably told him that that was really pretty. He might have thought it was really, really pretty. Next thing I know, Christmas Day 1989, uh, this was my dream build number one, let's call it. 75 gallon oceanic uh, tank that just fell into my lap. I didn't plan it at all. This was Christmas Day. Uh, certainly no hints that this was coming. And from back in the day, this was a dream build, not only because it was a dream come true, but also it had some really bitchin' stuff back in the day, such as the red barnacle cluster. If you've had this in your tank, raise your hand. If you still have it in your tank, raise your hand. There you go. Some people remember this. Some people might still have it. Dude, this was what we considered live rock. I still have a piece just like this upstairs. My parents were cleaning out their basement and they handed me a bunch of old coral skeletons. So yeah, I had this one. Who had this one? The Blue Ridge Coral. Yeah, this was cool too because this was like color. You could actually get some color out of this thing, which meant once a month we bleached it. That's right, you heard me right. We bleached it, keep this thing looking sparkly clean. Coral and algae, what? No one talked about that. Live rock ish, yeah, not really. It was coral skeletons. And then as I progressed in my saltwater tank career, I told my local fish store that I wanted an anemone. And they sold me one of these, a black light. Yeah, that was cool. Didn't work out too well. Because back in the day, when we when I got my first dream build, look, we didn't know that much. If you could keep pulsing Xenia alive, you were some kind of reefing god. Now everyone's looking at this going, get that out of the picture before it infects my tank. I don't want it anywhere near me. But look, that's how it was. So that's how I started. That was my first dream build, was this tank. The big lesson I took from that, we didn't know much. Didn't have much chance for success. There wasn't the internet. There were some books you relied on your local fish store. So if they're taking you for a run, you really didn't know. This was really the best that we could do. Now that was, I got my first tank when I was in fourth grade. My interest changed. I got out of reefing for 17 years. I think that's right. About 17 years, I was out of it. Now, how did I get back into it, which leads into all these more modern dream builds? So much as I don't like freshwater tanks, it started with a freshwater tank. For my birthday one year, my wife got me a freshwater tank that looked not much like this. Well, it could have looked like this. It was a kit and included a life plant. It was a 20-gallon high. She got it for me. It was a surprise and said, here you go. I heard you wanted an aquarium. I looked at it and I said, do you have the receipt? Because I'm going to take it back and make it salt water. Why? Because oh, she just informed me it was also shattered. It was the sign. She had the receipt and it was shattered. That thing had to go. Get it out of my house so I could have the salt water tank. Now, here's what happened. 20-gallon tank became a 55-gallon tank because everyone's had the 55-gallon tank, and that became the 90-gallon tank. Everything you see here happened in the span of eight months. It happened. My marriage is still with me today. This happened very quickly. Why? Because your new big tank is going to feel small in six months. This is the first lesson that I learned when I got back into reefing. 
I promise you. You're going to look at it within six months or less. It will feel small. Therefore, you have my permission to buy a bigger tank. If your wife or your spouse, coin goes both ways, ladies, gets upset at you, you can say, Mr. Saltwater Tank said I can buy a bigger tank. There you go. You have my permission to buy a bigger tank. So I landed, landed, I'm going to use that term roughly because this tank didn't last forever. Here was my 90 gallon tank day one. Look at that DIY song, man, that and got the job done, but it was definitely DIY. So here's me filling the tank. Here's about what it became, became before I tore it down. Uh, probably had another couple months on it than this, but it grew into this, and this tank had a lot of success. What made this work, even at a small scale? With this, it was consistency. Something I wrote about in my tank automation book was rituals. I talked to pilots, and they always run through the checklist. Even though they haven't memorized, they always go through the checklist every single time, whatever checklist it is. Talk to basketball players. When they're shooting a free throw, they have the same ritual. They either dribble it twice and shoot. Maybe they don't dribble it. They do the same thing every time to create a ritual, which creates consistency in your tank. That's a lot of what got this tank to where it was. It was a really good tank. I changed 5% of the water every week. I tested once a week. I just did these things and I did them religiously every week and it worked for me. And then I decided I wanted something bigger. I decided I would move halfway across the country. Why not? We were young. We had a newborn. It's easier when they're a newborn, right? So I tore the thing down. This was step one of tearing it down. So from this to this to that, it went bye-bye all in a matter of hours. It's gonna take you days to build it, years to grow it out, and hours to tear the whole thing down. That was it, that was when the tank left, someone came and bought it. These are the big lessons from this tank. Besides the consistency I just talked about, cheap is more expensive. When I got started back into the hobby, didn't have a lot of disposable income, so I was always trying to buy used things, buy the cheap things, and then just run with because I thought I was saving myself money. I don't know how many protein skimmers I went through. I started with the Coral Life Super 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 Skimmer. I think that's what it's called, the skimmer that everyone's had only once, and they usually don't have it for very long. And then I went to a was the Reef Euro Reef Euro Reef. It actually worked okay. And then I went to a Vertex skimmer back in the day because I stopped being cheap about it. when I was cheap. It always went back to bite me. This is true today. I upgraded things, spent a lot more money upgrading, dealing with issues than it would have been if I just bought it right the first time. The next lesson, you're always gonna overflow your mixing station, period. It happens every time. No matter if you set a timer, or you think you're gonna remember, some people say they hang a key around their neck, doesn't matter. You're always gonna overflow your mixing station. Maybe you only overflow a little bit. I hope that's you. Maybe you overflow it a lot and it's running out the garage. You're going to overflow your mixing station. So plan on that. Also, 90 gallons is a really nice size tank. If you're looking at a tank and you're thinking 55 or 75, go with the 90 gallon. The footprint is nearly the same. It is the same as the 75. It's just taller. Vertical is free real estate. So the 90 gallon tank not only was a really good tank for me, it's also a really nice tank. Nice size tank. I may put one back in this room. We'll see. Let's get the new tank in here first. All right. Then I went to my 225 gallon tank, which for those of you on the only measuring system that actually makes any sense, that's 851 liters. This tank was my, I'm going to show them tank. I'm going to get this thing set up quickly. It's going to grow really well. And everyone who doubted me is going to see it and I'm going to get to stick it to them. Right. And then this happened. If you follow me for a while, you know that one of my fish, maybe one of my fish, some of my fish brought in marine velvet. I got to go in front of the whole world and tell everyone that I messed up. Mr. I'm going to show them how this is done turned into I messed up. Nearly all my fish died. I drained the tank out, sterilized the thing, and got to start over in a very public way. What did I learn, of course? Quarantine all your fish. We talked about this throughout the last webinar series. I'll always remind people of this. Quarantine them. It only takes one, and it's not worth the risk. I will come back to this later tonight. In terms of tanks, 
Grandma's tanks just aren't very much fun. I had one, I wanted to try it out. I'm glad I did. I'm glad that tank was short lived because I really didn't like it. Lots of reasons. Number one, the light spillage in the room, lights got in your eyes. It was not fun. It was not fun to sit there and sit, sit and look at the tank. Standing there was okay, but sitting at the tank, no matter what angle I was at, I always had light in my eyes. It just wasn't much fun. Then the whole algae scraper issue. You drag the algae scraper along the top. If you do it too quick, which here's a hint, doesn't take too much to be too quick. Water comes up over the top, comes down and gets on the dry side of your algae scraper. And then you're wiping water all over the front of your glass. The last thing I didn't like the rimless because fish jumped out. And people say, yeah, you can put a net on it, but it totally ruins the rimless look. So I've had one rimless. I'm not going to have another rimless as a big display tank. I may have another rimless as a uh, frag tank, like that makes sense to me. I'm not going to have a display as rimless, just not my thing, not my pick cup of tea. So I got the rebuild. This is my blonde meso, which she is still in the tank behind me. That's my uh, trigger fish, blue throat that got uh, passed on to another home. But I got to rebuild. Then I got to move into another house. It was renting, so I moved into another rental. This is my 375 gallon tank which is 14, 1,419 liters. This tank also was up for about a year. The last tank, the 225, was up for about a year. The 375 was up for about a year. And then we moved again. So both of these tanks were only up for about a, a year, really not even a year because we were not in a house for over a year. And these tanks never really matured. They never had a chance to come into themselves one, because I didn't just have enough, I didn't have enough time, but also because of something that I learned with these tanks that I see over and over again with my clients' tanks, which is the 12-month mark is a big milestone. Now, those of you on the webinar, raise your hand if you're under the 12-month mark. Your tank has been set up for under a year. Let's get a, let's get a sense. Oh, just a couple of you. Okay, so some of you are just, just getting started. All right, I'm going to assume everyone else has their tank up for more than a year. Is there anyone on the webinar who doesn't have a tank at all? That's okay if you are. I'm just curious. Oh, no, no, someone raised your hand and then hit it right. Okay, some of you don't even have a hand. Maybe you're playing your next bill. That's cool. You don't have to have a tank to be here. You're still in the right place. So the 12-month mark is a big milestone. None of the tanks you just saw ever get to hit them, which means they never locked in. Now, I'm going to talk about this concept a little bit later on tonight, but just keep this in your head. If you're young with your tank, your, 12, your tank is 12 months old or younger, you feel like you're struggling with it, it happens. Once you hit that 12 month mark, I found things tend to lock in and get going. So if you're just new with your tank, your tank is young, give it time, it will come in there. Hang in there, you'll get there. All right, so then, I got to move into the 448 gallon tank. We bought a house, then it's my domain. I can do whatever the heck I want with it. Pick up, take out the window, pull off the siding, put in the forklift, and you're good to go. Let me tell you, moving a tank around with a forklift is really, 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 really easy. Easiest tank move that I've ever done was one with a forklift. We lifted it right up to the right uh, height because the stand was just inside the window and then you just drag it onto the stand. Okay, see, just like this. In the window, pulled over onto the stand and you're done. Then you go home. Easy, easiest tank move I've ever done. Forklifts make it really, really easy as well. Yes, that was easiest tank move ever I've ever done, period. Even the 90 gallon. Then I got the tank set up. This was the fish room. I didn't have the largest fish room in the world. A lot of people get bent out of shape about fish rooms thinking it has to be big. Look, big is great. If you have the ability to do that, have at it. My fish room wasn't all that big because I had a sloped ceiling. So whenever you walked in here, you had to do this. I'm certainly not going to miss that with the, with the new fish room. The point is, even if you have a small fish room, you're going to love it. You can do a lot on a very small scale. So if you have the capabilities to do it, mine was simply unfinished storage that I finished out. By all means, grab yourself the fish room. Here was the tank uh, pretty early on in its career. You can see my blonde Nacho, blonde Nacho, she's right there in the tank. The white tail bristle tooth is actually behind me in this tank as well. That fish has been with me, 
uh, what was that, 12, so eight years now? No, when we bought this house, five years. The blonde ace has been with me for eight. The white tail bristle tooth has been with me for five. All right, so this tank got up and rolling, and I got to hit that one year milestone, and that's when things really locked in. This is my sea bay anemone. That's still with me as well. Uh, and the tank behind me, the clownfish in this shot, and the clownfish in this shot is also in the tank behind me too. They're now over eight years old. Point is, the 12 month art is a big milestone. At that point, everything just tends to lock in, and then everything just took off with the tank. Why? Here's why. Now, I don't have any evidence for this. This is my best experience with talking with my experience and talking with other people in the industry who I trust. Why is this 12 month mark that I talk about so important? Why? Because biofilms get established. You're not really growing coral, you're really growing biofilms in your tank. Once all these layers of biofilms, basically bio biological crud, so to speak, not crud in a bad way, biofilms, things that are growing in the tank, after a year, they just get going, a certain amount of layers of them seem to lock in, and then the tank really goes. So that's one reason why I think the 12 month milestone is so important. Number two, you stop fiddling with your tank. When the tank is new, you're excited, which is totally fine. I want you to be excited. But after about a year, hopefully less than that, you're like, okay, I've got it set up. I've got all, if not most of the gear, I'm just gonna let this thing go. I put in a lot of the coral that I'm gonna put in. The tank is fully stocked and then things have a chance to go because everything that's there is gonna be there. The biology gets worked out and then the tank rolls. Okay, along the time that I was building up my 450 gallon tank, then I got very busy with my VIP build program where I design, build and install tanks for clients. Here's the key with the slides I'm about to show you. Only one of them, two of them, is a local tank. The rest are all at least 500 miles away. So it's not just something that can be like, hmm, let's go check on so-and-so's tank or something's wrong. Let's just drive up there and see what's going on. And this is me set it up for hobbyists, much like you. Only one of these tanks that I'm gonna show you is a tank that I maintain where the owner doesn't do hardly anything. The rest of these people are hobbyists just like you and no, they're not all one percenters. So I started building out all these tanks. And in the case with the tank that I just showed you in this tank, the client built their dream house, they call me back to build their dream tank. So I'm starting to build all these tanks for people in remote, or more remote areas. They're not local to me. And along the way, I got to do things where clients came to me very early on in the process, like this remodel. And they said, we're gonna cut, we're gonna gut this house, we want the tank to be the focal point of the first story, which is this is the before and after uh, photo of this tank. I need an updated photo uh, of that shot of that tank because it's fully grown out now. Uh, it looks fantastic. The owner's thrilled. Got to do some really cool stuff with life support rooms. This is probably my most favorite life support system that I've ever built. Here is the one tank that's local to me that I maintain that the owner doesn't do much. Now, this was an old tank. This is a 90 gallon tank. Another tank that I didn't maintain. The owner was a hobbyist. It was still local to me, but I didn't see this tank but once every three months when I came to take corals out of it because it was doing so well. Again, I'm just showing you systems that I built so I can talk to you about what I learned about doing this remotely, keeping an eye on things, all this lessons learned from remote success, remote builds. What did I learn? First of all, the 12 month mark is key. I just talked about that with my own tank, but a data set of one isn't that significant. So I started doing this with remote tanks and I found that once we hit that 12 month mark, then things really locked in. So part of my coaching with clients had to be, I understand you just built, spent a fair amount of money on this build. You're all excited for it. You see my tank and other clients tanks. You think your tank should be there immediately. It's going to take time. You have to hang in there Again, once you hit 12 months, about in that time frame, things really take off. Also, quarantine is very important. Several of my clients decided they didn't want to quarantine, and everyone who decided they didn't want to get quarantined has gotten nailed by it. They usually got velvet in their tanks and wiped out all, if not everything, in their tank. Then they had to either sit with their tank empty for a couple of months or completely start over. 
Also, nearly every single client that I've built the tank for wishes they went bigger. Now, I know what you're thinking. You may say, I don't have the space, to which I can say, you can always go taller. Number two, you may say, I don't have the money. Here's the thing. The price difference between tank sizes can actually be quite negligible. It may seem like a lot to go from a 225 to a 285. It's really not. That tank size, a 72, 24, 30 tall, or 72, 30 wide, 30 tall, that's the difference between a 225 and a 275. All you need to run those two tanks is maybe a bigger skimmer. You're going to need some more power heads, a little more live rock, a little more sand. The sum's going to be the same size. The footprint of the tank is the same, nearly the same size. You buy the glass and the stand once, and the rest of the stuff you can add on. The lighting is going to be the same. The automation for it is going to be the same. So the price difference between sizes can be negligible. Case in point, I built a, um, a tank for a client. He bought a new house, he brought me in. I always fly in to just scope out these builds and talk with people, brainstorm with them. We had a big 17 foot wall to which he wanted to put the tank. And we looked at a couple of different sizes. A 450 gallon tank, which is eight feet long, 561 gallon tank, which was gonna be 10 feet long, and then a 12 foot long tank, which is 600, and 73 gallons. So I said, look, I'll build you all three scenarios. I'll put them all on the wall in 3D. We'll render them out and you can look at them and then you can choose which route you want to go. The price difference between the 450, the 561, and the 673 for each two foot up he went in tank size cost him $3,000. So therefore he was getting an extra 100 gallons plus each size up that he went an extra two feet of display size but it only was going to cost him three grand so it's not like if you go from a 450 to a 561 it's going to cost you fifteen thousand dollars more the price difference can actually be negligible so as you're thinking about your build or you're dreaming about your next one you're like okay i'd like to go this size but you know what this size a little bit bigger is really what i think that i want because mark says that every within six months the tank is going to feel small if you've got the space if you've got the budget even if you don't have the budget look there are ways to stretch it you can get the tank and the stand in. You can always add more lights if you need it. You can add more power heads if you need it. The point is, don't be scared about looking at the next size up. You might, may find that price difference is actually quite negligible. All right, another lesson I learned, just because you set the tank up the same, nearly all the same, doesn't mean that they're all going to behave the same. This is very true if I set up two tanks right next to one another, exactly the same gear started on exactly the same day and run the exact same way those two tanks would very likely behave very different from one another why can't tell you exactly why don't know what it is about the biology but it changes between tanks every tank that i've set up even though they're built on pretty much the same platform the design is largely the same in terms of what i like to use for filtration the tanks behave very, very differently. This has been a hard um, lesson to teach clients because they see a successful tank of mine and they think, mine's definitely going to look that way. I'm going to do everything I can. I'm going to coach them to get there. Look, sometimes it doesn't always work out. A lot of my builds have thrived and a couple of them have just done okay. So just because you have one success with one tank, if you're upgrading to the next one, you're adding a second tank to your life, don't be surprised if it doesn't go as well as the first one. Sometimes it just goes that way. It's nothing personal. We're dealing with live animals. We're dealing with something that we don't know that much we, about. We think we do, um, but we don't always do. Now, that being said, learning to listen to your tank is one of the biggest things that I recommend that you learn how to do. Every tank is different, as I just said. So learning what makes that tank happy as opposed to what made your other tank happy is very, very important. The new relationship, a new tank set up. Even if you've inherited a tank from someone and you move the system largely set up, it's going to behave very differently. So you got to learn to listen to what that tank is telling you in terms of what it likes and how it wants to be run. Every tank is a work in progress as each tank is different. This is something that I definitely learned about reef tanks. When you think you've gotten there, something changes or you want to do something different, 
So it's always a work in progress. I would encourage you not to think of your reef tank, your build as something that's done and complete. It's always evolving, it's always progressing. That's part of the fun of it. As soon as you say you're done, I found that's when clients get bored and then want to check out. All right, more lessons I've learned from working with remote clients and having remote success with that. You want to leave your tank alone, ish. I'm not saying set it up and ignore the thing. That's not why you set it up. But build it and then quit fiddling with it. Don't always add new stuff. Don't always go sticking your hand in there. You don't have to keep the thing spotless. I've had clients who I've gone back and visited their tanks 12 months after I've set it up, and it looks as good as day one. The sump is completely spotless. They're always scrubbing things down. They're always doing large water changes. Look, the point is build it, set it up, and then leave the thing alone. Test your tank's water, of course, quarantine your fish, test your water, write down your results, write down what you put in the fish, put in the fish, put in the tank, love your tank, but don't go fiddling with the tank constantly. Don't always go moving your aquascaping around. My first build, that's something that caused me a lot of crashes. I was always moving aquascaping around, causing the tank to crash, stirring things up, stressing out fish. Just leave the thing alone, get it set up, and then largely leave it alone. If you're always going to add new gear, maybe you want to add a new fish, add a new coral, I get that. The point is, quit fiddling with the thing. But always change what you're doing with it. Choose your path and stick to it. Pay attention to your tank, find out what works to it, and then run with it. Don't try to squeeze your tank into a box. This is something that I see a lot of people do, and it causes a lot of headaches with people because they think these are ideal water parameters, and this is how I should run my tank because someone told me. There's some guideline parameters that you need to follow about building your tank and running your tank. And then there's kind of the minutia that you have to get into. What makes this tank work over making the next tank work? You have to dance with that. It's always changing. The tank is always evolving. You've got to have some wiggle room. I'm not saying throw out everything that you learned. I'm saying be willing to understand that the tank is always moving around. It's a relationship. Things change. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's bad. Sometimes you're not giving your tank much and it's giving a lot back to you. Sometimes you're giving it everything and it's giving you nothing back. That's how it goes sometimes. Also, choose your path in terms of what works for you and stick to it. It's very easy to get lost on the internet. Always hearing about something new. Let's try that. Let's try this new methodology. You can easily get lost in things. Who do you trust? The point is, choose the path that works for you. You know this works. Certainly be open to hearing about new things. Don't go diss someone because they come up with some new idea, but be skeptical about it and be hesitant to impose it on your tank. Okay, that's what I learned from these remote tanks. Along the way, more recently, something's happened with my own build. It went bye-bye because part of it, yeah, it didn't seem that big anymore. At first, I was like eight feet by three feet. It's huge. And then it didn't feel that big anymore. So what did I learn from this tank now that it's out of my life? By the way, still the easiest tank move I've ever done. This is the tank going out. Looks a little dirtier than uh, coming in. This is the tank on the way out. Got a forklift again, pallet, hauled that thing right out the window. Again, easiest tank move I've ever done. This tank had a lot of success. This is a bigger than palm sized piece of nuclear grapes from Worldwide Corals. I grew that from about a two inch frag uh, this is Worldwide Coral's Jello Shot Millie. There's a fragging tool for reference. Uh, that was a big piece. I think I still have a piece of that. Um, here's the tank coming down. Remember I said it's going to take you days to build it, months to get it mature, and then years to grow it out. It's reversed when you go to tear the thing down. This was about 10 a.m. I'm draining this thing out. I've already ripped down a lot of the coral and livestock. Um, yeah coming to pieces. All this hard work that you've put into, I don't want to say it's going down the drain because maybe you're selling things off or you're upgrading. It just, per se, you're tearing it down. You're just, you're destroying what you did. That doesn't mean that it's dead forever or going away forever. Here's that same jello shot Millie uh, tank, sh a tank a shot from up above. The point is this can be an emotional process for you. You remember when the frag was this big or maybe it was this big, and now it's hopefully this big because you've had all that success. It can be emotional. Looking at my tank when it was like this, I'm like, 
the past couple of years of my life is now gone. I have memories, I have photos. It went on to serve its next owner very well, but everything that you built is gone. The tank is now leaving. What you built is over. Even if you took everything back and put it from the containers, put it back in the tank, it wouldn't be the same. Okay, so what did I learn from this tank? Number one, automation can save. The automation game on my 450 gallon tank was definitely dialed in, partially because the automation that was available to me was a lot more advanced than what I had on my previous tanks. Between better automation and new gear that came out, like water testers, automatic water testers, that made a big difference. I can't tell you how many times having automation on my tank saved my life. Now, it doesn't all necessarily have to be high tech. There's some automation that I had on there, like low tech things like float valves for RODI systems shutting off just as a backup. There's no tech to that, and it worked really well. Having backup systems in place automatically, for example, if you're running a calcium reactor, having an alkalinity solution mixed up and put on a dosing pump ready to go, then you can handle automatically. This happened to me. I was on my way to Australia for two and a half weeks, left the house, my calcium reactor went down. I get ready to get on the airplane to go to LA to get the plane to Australia, and my apex jumps to me and says, hey, your CO, your uh, pH level on your calcium reactor is really high. You should do something about it. I'm like, well, that's weird. I can't turn the plane around. I'm not going back. My tank buddy came over. He's like, yeah, your calcium reactor is dead. All I had to do then was turn on the doser with the alkalinity. And I told him, look, you're probably going to have to refill it once or twice while I'm away. But I knew that I could dial things in because they had automation that's in there. So also, once you've locked in your tank, leave it alone. Once I figured out what made my 450 gallon tank work, I let it run that path. What made that tank work? A couple things. Number I mean, one, automatic water changes. I tried stopping water changes. Definitely didn't work for me. Automatic water changes did. I did, I think, three gallons a week. Not much, but it worked. That's what made that tank work. I listened to it, and I said, you want water changes? I'm going to give you small water changes. Also, adding more fish in once you're fully stocked, because I say fully stocked because you never really fully stock. There's always a fish that you want, a new fish comes into the trade. It can really backfire, especially once your tank's been set up for a while. If you have your core group of fish, you haven't added any more fish to the tank in a long time, and you put something in, even if it's aggressive, everyone loses their, their cool. They can go bazonkers. Fish that were always very nice now become very mean. Mean fish become sissies and get beat up on. So if your tank is established, you've got your same mix of fish in there for over six months, I would think very hard about adding more fish. That can really backfire. Also, every tank has its growing preferences. This is always a hard pill for me to swallow, but it's true. I've had tanks that won't grow chalices very well. I've had tanks that won't grow clams. My 450 gallon tank you just saw that was very successful, wouldn't keep a clam. Tried every single one there was, every different methodology with them, didn't matter, couldn't keep a clam. Sometimes that happens. So if you're struggling with one type of coral, don't take it personally. It may just not work in that tank for reasons that we don't understand. You can always try different pieces. It will really drive you mad if you take that piece and put it in a tank right next to it, even a tank that's tied into the system and it does well. The point is, every tank has its growing preferences. It may or may not like the coral that you would like to grow in there. Don't take it personally. You're listening to your tank. Just know, look, that's out. I would love to have a clam. Thinking about getting one for this tank just to try it. That tank wouldn't grow clams, but I said, you know what? You're growing everything else really well. I'm okay with it. I'll let that go. And now, once that tank is gone, I get to start this process all over again with you guys and gals. For adding on to the house, if you've been following me on social media, I've been into this process for about two months now. Uh, the new tank is going on the second story. This is a look at this steel that's on the exterior on the new addition part of the, I say exterior, meaning the new addition part of the house. The tank is going to be indoors. This is going to get covered up. I'll show you that in just a second. But I'm starting all over again. So everything that I learned about my old tanks, yeah, I'm going to bring this to the new system. But I get to learn all over again what makes the new system tick. How is it going to do? 
I hope well. I expect that it will do well. And look, there's a fair amount of unknown about this. I don't know. I've got to figure that system all out all over again from a bare slate because I'll use dry rock, dry sand, and fill it up with RODI water. So the thing is going to be sterile. Some of these corals in the tank behind me are going to come over, but they're going to go through a quarantine process first. I have the room for that in the new fish room, which is what you're looking at here. All these guys are actually standing in the new fish room. Uh, here's more of a look at what it's going to be like built out. Uh, first story fish room, second story tank with office. So here I am again, starting the process all over again with you guys and gals, taking everything that I just learned that I talked to you about tonight and applying it all over again to do this talk again in a year and see what I've learned from the new system. Hopefully I've learned something new because it is always a learning process with reef tanks. Every tank is different. To me, that's what makes it fun. If it was truly turnkey, I think it would be too easy. There's a fair amount of, do you have what it takes in terms of sticking true to the course and running your tank out and seeing how it matures that a lot of people just aren't up to. All right, with that, I'm gonna flip it over to questions. Raise your hand if you have a question. I can take your text question as well. Uh, fire away. Uh, let's go with the um, first question. Let's go with the text question since uh, people are a little shy tonight. All right, uh, the Oz King wants to know, what do you do with the coral and other stuff when moving? All right, great question. What do you do with your coral? and your fish when you're moving. A couple options there. One, you can keep them all. If you like what you have, by all means, keep them. Here's something to keep in mind. Your tank, really your coral, fish not as much, but coral, they're gonna get angry with you. So if I know I'm moving, if I know I'm tearing down a tank, if I know I'm building a new tank and I did it with my 450 gallon tank, I take frags and then I spread them out across people. I sent them to clients, I sent them to local uh, tank buddies, people that I trust, people that I know what they know what they're doing, because part of me knows that those corals are going to get angry. I'm trying to keep the mother colonies. They're very likely not going to make it, especially with SPS. They just freak out for no reason. Even if you're taking the same tank and moving it two feet next to it, across the room even, I know that's going to happen. I'm going to give myself some insurance by placing frags out there. Fish, look, the biggest thing I can tell you about moving your fish is when you put them in the new tank, even if it's a holding tank, pecking orders get reshuffled re around, reestablished. Fish are going to potentially start fighting again. Don't be surprised uh, that that's going to happen. So if you can hold your fish in any kind of holding system, that's a great time to get rid of fish that you don't like. I got rid of some dotty and my orc, not my orchid, my splendid dotty back, which was killing smaller fish in my 450. It went away, my orange spot goby went away. That's a great time to do that because when you drain the ocean, fish are really easy to catch. It's a good time too. You can get rid of some weedy coral that you don't like. Maybe you want to trade for some coral too because hopefully you've got some uh, big colonies out there that you can do that with. The big thing is now's your time to get rid of the old, get rid of things you don't like, add new things in. Just know your corals are very likely not going to like this process. So by all means, put frags out there Keep some at home if you want, but also put them other places. So when you're ready for your, with the new tank, you're ready to go back and get them, you can go back and do that. Give yourself that backup. Great question. Dana wants to know, how do you know when your tank is dialed in? Dana with the $1 million question. All right, Dana. Some of it's just a feel thing. You look at your tank and you know corals are growing. You also have a lot of confidence in your tank. You look at a coral you would like and you're like, tank's doing well. I feel like this tank can grow it. I'm gonna go and do it. And you're gonna grow, try to grow that coral, you're gonna purchase that coral. When you know you, you've tracked your tank long enough with your testing parameters, you can know where your alkalinity likes to stay. Maybe there's some feeling with that. And I've done that with clients' tanks as well. I run alkalinity at nine and see how things go. The tank doesn't like it. I'll drop it down to six and a half and see what I get. I'm not gonna do that quickly, but I'll fiddle with it. I'll see what works. I'm taking notes, I'm testing things, I'm logging all this, and then I'm looking for trends. And a lot of it is just looking at the tank. Are the corals growing? Is everything growing? All right, good. Then I know I've got it dialed in. This is what's working for me. I'm going to leave it 
at bat um, and let the tank do its thing. I'm going to stay in these basic parameters, Dana, but there's going to be some rise and run. There's a little bit like there's some gray area outside of it, but overall you try to keep it mostly in this box because that's where the tank has told you um, that it's happening. All right, let's go to some live questions. Who has a live question for me tonight? All right, Dave. Uh, Dave B, I'm gonna unmute you, Dave. Have at it. Are you with us, Dave? I'm here, but I didn't really have a question. Oh. I just can't figure out the hand. Oh, well, there you go. You got it now. All right, Dave, well, thanks for being with me. I'll, uh, I'll roll to the next one. Uh, Let's see. Jeff. Jeff D. has a question. All right, Jeff, have at it. Hello. Uh, thanks again for uh, going through and uh, putting these together for us each and every week. I think I'm uh, in the exact same boat as the guy before. I couldn't tell if the hand was up or down. Uh, <laughs> but I'll just take this opportunity to say thank you. Uh, they're always very informative, and it's great uh, getting to chime in with you here on Sunday evenings. Hey, well, thanks for being with me, uh, Jeff. Have a great Sunday. Uh, stay safe. Thanks, everyone, for the uh, the well wishes. Uh, I appreciate it. Good to know that uh, this is not falling on deaf ears. I put a show out there on the internet. It kind of goes into the black hole. I don't know how I, what the feedback is, other than some comments, which are always kind of interesting. So it's good to hear it straight from the horse's mouth. All right, Mike T. Like Mr. T. Have at it, Mike. Hey, Mark, thanks very much for putting this on again. Uh, one question I had, you had mentioned one year being a big milestone. Um, given the maturity of it, would you recommend putting most of your corals in at the one year period or would you rather wait until after the one year period? Great question. If my one year period is my milestone, when am I putting in most of my coral? So we talked in previous webinars about my canary and coal mine. So I'll put some tester corals in, hardy zoas, hardy LPS, hardy SPS, and see how it goes. And then I'm feeling that if those are doing well, then I'll keep adding more and then I'll keep adding more, knowing that in that first year, it's not surprising if things are going well, then for some reason the, the tank starts kicking and screaming. So there's a little bit of kind of give and take on this. How much risk do you want to take? Knowing that in the first year, don't be as surprised if things just kick off or all of a sudden go backwards for no apparent reason. There's no right or wrong with that one, Mike. It's really how the tank is doing, how much confidence you have, how much you might want to spend. I mean, the other piece of this is like, you got to figure out what works for your tank. So for example, if you know you love clams and you've got all these clams bought or you know that you want to buy them, you're going to wait, say, I'm going to wait till the one year mark. You put all your clams in there at once, your tank may not like them. So Hopefully you figure that out in the first year mark before you go make a big investment with things. That's why I'll try corals along the first year. Things are going well. I may speed up the time that I'm adding things. Mostly though, I mean, around the year for one year mark, I've gotten a pretty good mix of LPS. Probably done with buying my zoanthids for the most part. My SPS are largely coming in there, but I'm not gonna go buy a, a very expensive frag just yet because uh, I wanna see how that tank is going but i'm certainly not going to leave the tank with minimal corals in it in the first year and then after the one year mark go okay let's go on a buying spree and throw everything in i do think there is some value in buying corals especially lps or even some mariculture corals that have that um, skeleton base on them usually there's a lot of sponges on there other critters that can come in all there's some critters we can't even see the mild the microbiology the small stuff when you bring it in that base, you can bring that stuff in that adds to the biodiversity of your tank. So I want to do that um, along the way. Great question. Um, this is bring, taking me back to, I've got to set up this new tank. I've got to go through that first year. We'll see how it does. It'll be fun. All right, Tyler, you have a question. Have at it, Tyler H. Yeah, hey, Mark, how you doing? I'm great, how are you tonight? I'm good. Um, so I'm starting up a 215 gallon tank. It's the largest tank I've had yet. And to save a little cash, I decided to go with a 40 gallon breeder for a temporary sump. Do you see any issues with running it without baffles or not? No, I've, uh, one of my buddies back in Texas did that um, very successful tank. 
a 40 gallon breeder as a sump actually, and it worked quite well. I mean, part of it is going to be feeling it out with your skimmer. Skimmers have a tendency to dump out micro bubbles just because they've got a lot of bubbles in them. So you may be fighting that a little bit with your return pump, but some return pumps have sponge filters you can put on the front that can help cut it down. The water may have to go through a refusion before it gets to your return pump, so that can knock down your bubbles. But overall, Tyler, look, running it with down and baffles, other than the micro bubbles, it can work just fine. Personally, I've done enough sumps now that I wouldn't do it because I know what I like, but uh, I certainly don't see that as a reason why your tank couldn't be successful. And the nice thing is about a 40 gallon breeder is if you wanted to drain it and silicone in some baffles, you could always do that. Good luck with a new tank. 215 gallon Tyler is a nice size. Uh, please quarantine your fish. Don't go through what I did. All right, Tony B, you're up, Tony. Tony, it's all you. Are you with us, Tony? All right. Tony must have either not had his hand up or he forgot to unmute his mic. All right, Robert, have at it. We'll go to some text questions. Robert, why? Hey, Mark. Thanks for having us again. Appreciate it. Thank you for being here, Robert. So I've been trying to take these words of patience to heart. Uh, first build, been out of the hobby for 15 years. So everything's new, doing lots of research. But uh, the family's definitely, uh, patience is wearing thin for them. Ah. Suggestions on getting them to the 12 year or 12 months mark. <laughs> so why do you feel like their patience is wearing thin? Um, I got a 50 gallon, plumb my own sump. I'm sitting down in what I'm hoping to be my fish room. Uh, got the RO on the wall. Uh, it's just one thing after the other, um, <laughs> trying to learn about it, trying to make good decisions. Like you said, um, uh, not cheap out up front here. Um, I, as everyone out there knows this Corona, eh? uh, times are tough. So it's just hard to justify some of these, uh, expenses when I got a glass cube sitting up there with nothing in it. Yep. I get it. Great. Uh, great question. And a great point, Robert, this is especially true when your tank isn't doing well. Now, if it's young, you're putting a lot into it with not much return at, at that point. But also, if you're dealing with issues with your tank, as Robert said, you've got this big glass, small or large glass thing in your house, which may or may not have a lot in it. it seems like you're putting a lot of money into it and things either aren't happening or they were happening well and now they're going backwards. So what do you do about it? Now, Robert, in your case, your question was about how do I get them to the 12 month mark couple ways that I recommend do that. One, if they can pick their own fish, especially if it's your kids, if you have children, look, they usually love that. It's their fish. They like to see where it is in the tank. Maybe you can even get them to feed it and help you take care of the tank. That's a great way to do it, especially with the ladies as well. I've often told people, look, let your wife pick a very nice fish. I should say very nice. Let her decide what she likes. Here's the thing. She's probably going to pick one that's not reef safe. Then you can have a conversation with her about a second tank. Be like, look, this fish will eat everything else in the tank. You don't want to scar the children to watch them do that. Let me just set you up another tank. It can be the aggressive tank. It has worked. The point is, get them involved. Now, maybe it's a fish. Maybe it's a coral. I gave a cucumber to a person once, and his kids absolutely loved it. They call it his slug. Now, all of a sudden, his kids are into his tank. So find some way um, to get... Um, them involved some way or another. Fish, get them a coral. Part of it too, maybe you take them around to show someone else's tank, really nice tank, and ask the person, tell me about how this has gone. And they're probably going to tell you really well or it hasn't gone well, that they're ups and down with it. They may need to understand that it's just going to take some time. The other thing is, you know, it may just be something where you're spending a lot of time on the tank, but not as much time with them. Maybe you need to re-engage them on their turf as well. Every situation is different, but I found that getting them involved, and usually the livestock is a great way to do it. People like that, kids like that, wives like that as well. Uh, all things that I found that helps. Good luck with the build, good luck with the project. Even if you can put in smaller corals, go for it. Get something in that tank. 
uh, to show them that it's starting to pay off. All right, Tim wants to know, he has a, he wants a seven or eight foot tank that's 30 by 30. Do I get them custom made and they sell them commercially? All right, Tim, um, all my builds are custom because I locked in on what I like on tanks and every tank is different. I usually have to do custom sizes. Uh, I think Planet sells the uh, 963030 uh, under their Mega Matrix series, which we have over at saltwateraquarium.com. I believe that's more of a commercially noble off the shelf type of tank. I don't use Starfire glass. I have found that it's not worth the cost. Once the tank is full, you're not gonna be able to tell a difference. Uh, and I always find glass. I service one acrylic tank and it's not fun. Every client that I've ever had that's had an acrylic tank will never have another one. So I always go glass. But Tim, check the Mega Matrix series um, over on saltwateraquarium.com. I believe that they have one. If not, they can also quote you up a custom tank. All right. Let's see here. Gabe wants to know, how would I set up a new tank in the same location? Oh, one of those. This is actually fun. So you have a tank and you want to put your new tank in the same place. You want to know, do you drain it and strip everything down and move it and set it up in a temporary location, something easier? Um, well, Gabe, if you're putting the new tank in the same place, you've got to get the old tank out of the way even if you drain the tank and move it as a system, which I don't recommend, you fill it back up with water, it's very likely going to act very different. So if I know I'm moving the tank, even if it's just over enough to put in the new tank, I'm still taking frags and spreading them out as backup. Absolutely do that, because don't be surprised if your fish gets um, tank, your fish, your tank, everything in it gets upset with you. That's really the best thing that you can do. If you can take the tank as a unit, Keep it as intact as possible and just move it so you can put the new tank in. That's great. It'll make it very easy because you had everything set up on the old tank to make it easy. Temporary tanks are temporary tanks. They're okay, but you're not very committed to them because you know it's temporary. They're usually something you hobble together like me around here. This stuff is okay, but it's not great. I'm not that excited about it um, because I know it's temporary. It's just not here for very long. So if you can keep what you got, that's gonna uh, make it very easy for you. Have, managing multiple holding tanks just isn't fun. If you can avoid it, I would do it. All right, great question. Uh, let's see here. How are we doing on the time? All right, let's take a couple more questions here. Let's go back to the live questions. If you have a question, make sure you live, raise your hand and I will call on you. All right, let's go to the top of the alphabet because you guys are always first. Adam H. Have at it, Adam. Good evening. How are you doing? I'm well. How are you? Very good. Very good. I'm in the same boat as the gentleman before. <laughs> I've okay. been out for about 15 years and starting over again, finally. Wow. I've watched all your videos and really appreciate all your knowledge and all the new technology. Thank you very much for all that. Yeah, thank you. So 15 years with your old tank? Yeah, my old tank was a 90 gallon also, and I'm running, basically I'm turning my 90 gallon into the sump. Ah. So this will be interesting, yeah. <laughs> Talk about getting in downgrade, like here's my display. Oh, you were great to me for 15 mm -hmm. years? Now you get to go under the tank as a sump, sucker. All right, it'll work. <laughs> but it'll... no, um, I'm looking for the new tanks, and what's, a, what's one of the better quality tanks that you like out there right now, as far as like, 100 to 150 range. That's about the size footprint that I have available in this condo. Um, so I get all my tanks from Planet Aquariums. So okay. those guys are the old Oceanic builders, if you remember Oceanic. Yes, um, that's what I used to have. That's actually what yeah. the sump's going to be. <laughs> there you go. And it's still in one piece because they're always overbuilt. The rule with the Oceanics was bring an extra set of hands because you're going to need it. Because they're heavy, because they're overbuilt. So uh, they're the old oceanic guys. I trust them to build my tanks. So that's uh, who I use. There's certainly other brands out there that likely know what they're doing. I mean, the Reef Savvy guys, Felix builds a nice tank. Um, certainly don't have anything against them. Um, you know, most of my clients and me as well aren't willing to wait six to 12 months. So, you know, planning gets it done for me. I trust them. Uh, I found the price is right. The quality is definitely there. 
and they have plenty of experience behind it as well. Um, I'm still going glass. If I was going to go acrylic, I had weird dimensions that required it. Uh, I would give the uh, Titan guys a call out in Phoenix. Uh, talk to Brian out there if you're going to go the acrylic route. Now, I'm probably going to stay with glass as well. Good. I, I actually managed to save my old mag pumps, and I still have an old ATEC ETSS protein screen. Ooh. Are you going to use it? Yes, I am. It's still working really good. I tested it a couple times now <laughs> just to make sure everything's still working. I mean, nothing wrong with it. A mag drive and an ATEC. <laughs> All right. I hope you have cheap power where you are. Yeah, actually, I'm pretty lucky <laughs> so far. <laughs> All right, Adam. Well, good luck with the uh, with the new build. Um, I'm excited to get see the new life for the 90 gallon tank. Show me a photo. Uh, certainly can't say that I've taken an old tank and made it into a sump, but that's uh, one way to reuse it. Um, yeah, I can. I just can imagine if the tank had a personality like I've given you so much, now you're gonna damn bury me. Uh, as a sump. All right, Jeremy wants to know what are other options in an arrow crab to remove bristle worms. I don't remove bristles, Jeremy. Let them hang out in the tank. Uh, they're a good part of your cleanup crew uh, and part of it. All right, Alex wants to know what basic parameters do I initially set the new tank for? Alex, you know, really, other than the salinity, get it at 1.025 or 35 ppt, uh, depending on which route you go i keep the temperature between 77 and 78 then it's largely around what salt i use every salt has the parameters that they advertise so this is what it mix it up says mix mix it up mixes up to we have the quite english on that one my mother would have my head if she was listening that's my basic starting parameters this is what i know where the salt mixed up to but if the salt mixed up to five dkh you can be like okay something's wrong i'm going to want to get that higher round seven or higher, but mixed up above 10, I'm going to want to do something about it. But other than that, pretty much mix up the salt, put it in the tank and go, here's where I'm starting. Let's go from here. I'm not going to change my salts because I have at that point what works for me. Also, these are the parameters of the salt. I know I'm going to be doing water changes. So that's where I'm going to want to be. So therefore, this is where I'm going to hang out. And then I just keep an eye on things. Are things happy? Does the tanks seem to be okay with this? Maybe you want to go higher alkalinity. Okay, you can start dosing to get the higher. But overall, I let the salt mix drive it at first and go from there. Um, Dana wants to know about my sea bay. Stick with the bubble tips for starters. Uh, sea bays can be quite tricky. Uh, so Dana, the bubble tips are going to be the really the easiest uh, way to go on that. All right, James wants to know how many months should your tank, how old should your tank be before you start adding coral? Uh, James, I do it within the first month um, before I do it. Uh, um, let's see here. Trying to understand some text questions. Second question, if wants to do things. Newbie tank setup for selection. Ah, okay. Gabe wants to know what's a few of my big newbie tank setup selection mistakes all right gabe first one is being cheap every time i've been cheap it's cost me more money more headaches in the long run i'm not saying you have to buy the top of the gear stuff but when i'm looking at gear for example protein skimmers i'm going to say i need a protein skimmer that's appropriate for a 200 gallon tank here are all the options here's the most expensive that'll fit here's the slowest ones probably the slowest two i'm going to throw out and that is with other everything in my life if i'm getting bids on anything the lowest bid, I always throw it out because either that person isn't worth it, they don't value their time, or they're going to cut so many corners, but that's how they can charge such a cheap price. So I don't buy the bottom of the line. You don't have to buy the top just because it's expensive. doesn't always mean that it's better. It has more potential to in my mind. It doesn't always mean it's that way. So going cheap was definitely one. Not quarantining was a big newbie mistake that I didn't do. Um, the other thing that I made a lot of mistakes with in the beginning was getting excited by all the pretty bottles. Walk into my local fish store and there are all these bottles with the pretty colors of fish and coral on there. And I'm like, oh, I got to buy this and I got to buy this and take them home with me. I don't really know what they do, but I'm going to dump them into my tank. And then I was just 
fighting it all the time because I didn't really know what it did, or if I didn't know what it do, I didn't really understand why it was important. Or it turned out that a lot of stuff didn't do jack for the tank. I was just dumping some hopefully magic elixir in the tank and see what I got. So I would say find your methodology that you like. Do you want to do a refugium? Do you not want to do a refugium? Do you want to run ultra low nutrients? Do you want to have a softy tank? Find out whatever that is for you and just say, look, this is my basic framework I'm going to work in. I'm going to stick around this. I'm not going to try to do an ultra low nutrient system and then add a refugium or then add an algae scrub. There are two different methodologies that are fighting one another. So pick your course and say, this is the lane I'm going to stay in and then go down that lane. Give it time. Know that if you're going to choose a course for your tank, it, it may not, you may not see results, tangible results for a couple months. So you got to stay the course. You got to stay with it. Uh, great question. Good luck uh, with the new project. All right, let's take one more live question. The Canada crowd is quiet tonight. Uh, they're just watching. Maybe they're full of poutine and they have food coma. Let's see. Um, all right. So you just got their hand up. A couple of you have got your hand up. And you've had your hand up, or I'm calling you and didn't put your hand down. So let's go to a text question. Scott wants to know, in my listen to my tank mantra, what range of nutrient levels, specifically nitrates and phosphate range, have you found across successful tanks? Great question, Scott, because I haven't found a range that is works as a, okay, I'll give you a range, zero to 50. I've had clients who had very successful SVS tanks, their nitrate range were, two, were 20 to 30 parts per million. And their nutrient, their phosphate levels were like 2.0, not 0.02, not 0.2, but 2.0. And the tank will get really, really well. I was looking at the tank, I ran the water test and I was like, I can't be right. I went back and did the water test again, and it was right, even when it got another test kit. The water test was still right. Point is, that's what worked for that tank. Now, here's the key with this though, Scott, and everyone else listening. That tank didn't get to that elevated nutrient levels and grow coral really, really well from the start. That tank was an older tank, and it had an established track record behind it. So it's my theory that the corals got used to the higher nutrient levels over time, and they were okay with it. So if you're starting out your tank, things should be zero across the board, and that's a good place to start. So the range for me, of zero to 50 on nitrates, zero to 3.0 on phosphates. If it's a new tank, most of my tanks, nearly all of my tanks are low nutrient systems just by the fact that they have plenty of filtration. The client does an overstock with feeding good quality food. Nutrient level is gonna rise over time. I understand that, especially as they're adding more fish. So I'm not concerned about nutrient levels going from zero to then going to two parts per million. Part of it to me is like, okay, this tank is maturing. I know it's starting to come around. So then I'm starting to figure out where is this tank going to ride? Because at some point the client's done adding fish. So I should be able to see a constant level of nutrients in the tank. Maybe we have to add GFO because we've, the fish have gotten bigger or now we've gotten our bio load in there and it maybe it's just a little bit beyond what the tank can naturally process so it needs a little bit of help but i'm going to say look, pretty much done adding fish so i know these are nitrate and phosphate levels somewhere in here is where i'm going to be let's then put stuff in the tank and see how it goes then i'm just building a track record the tank is doing well with those levels so okay this is where the tank's happy as long as i'm close to this that's where i'm going to stay and then I just start building out the tank from there. I really try not to get caught up in the numbers. I'll tell clients not to get caught up in the numbers. The only numbers to really get quote, caught up on are the ones that you found that work that work well for your tank. Then you run with it. And then I just say, look, baby, you drive. This is where you're going to be happy. I'm going to keep you in this lane mostly. And we're just going to grow with this thing together uh, and enjoy. All right, Scott, great question. With that, everyone. To wrap it up on a Sunday evening. I hope you all are staying safe. Looks like we're going to be coming out of this COVID thing. Places are starting to open up. Certainly wash your hands, stay safe, stay apart from one another a little bit longer. Enjoy your tanks. Don't go disappearing. Don't forget about it. all the hard work you put into it, not only over the years, but also over these past couple weeks. Thanks for being here. We'll be back next Sunday evening, same time, 8.30 Central. 
Have a great week, everyone. Enjoy your tanks. And I will keep you updated on the build as things happen. And uh, excited to start this process over again and revisit this whole learning your tank thing again. Because uh, it's always a bit of a wild card and every tank is different. All right, everybody. Have a great night. I will catch you next week.